Welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. So happy you are here. My goal with this channel is to bring inspirational speakers to the mic in the field of yoga, massage, body work, and beyond. Follow us at Native Yoga and check us out at nativeyogacenter.com. All right, let's begin. All right, welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. Today I have the pleasure of bringing to you Joseph Armstrong. On Joseph's website, he wrote, Yoga is a method of exploring your inner spaces so that you might see yourself, accept yourself, love yourself, love others as you love yourself, exist gently. And that's a great way to intro in Joseph. He's a really gifted Ashtanga yoga practitioner and teacher. He's the director of Miami Life Center in Miami at the Miami Yoga Garage. His website is josepharmstrongyoga.com. His Instagram handle is under the same name. I will have those links provided in the show notes below. And so with that being said, let's go ahead and intro Joseph in. Here we go. I'm extremely pleased to have Joseph Armstrong here today. Joseph, are you there? Hi there, Todd. (laughs) How are you? I'm doing good. I'm so good today, actually. I just finished my practice, so I'm still uh, coming out of that. For, for better or worse. <laughs> um, and no, for better. Always for better. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, uh, I'm just uh, making some time to uh, speak with you and, and share a little bit about my yoga practice. Well, I really appreciate it. I reached out to our friend, Tim Feldman and Tim, highly recommended you and said, you got to talk with Joseph. And so I really appreciate him referring and also for you taking time out of today. And on that note, just so that we can get to know you, can we go back in time a little and can you tell me about your first yoga experience and how you fell into yoga and or found the yoga practice? Yeah. Um, so I started practicing yoga in, I think it was around 2008 or so. And uh, at that time, I was living in Washington, D.C. And um, I came to it at the invitation of a friend. A friend of mine was already doing the yoga, and uh, she invited me to go with her to a class. And uh, the name of the studio she took me to was called Stroga. Stroga. So, Stroga. So it was a mixture of of different modalities, and um, it was a really fascinating place in a great old building in Washington D.C. Um, and it was a wonderful class, and it really like I I always tell people that I knew right away that um, the yoga practice was going to be something important in my life after yeah. that first class. That's awesome. You had that initial, you got, you got bit by the yoga bug. Yeah, right away. I, I knew. Um, and it was a weird experience though, because, you know, my first, I believe it was my first yoga class also included some breath work. And um, if you've never done yoga before and suddenly everyone starts doing like alternate nostril breathing, <laughs> it can be a bit like of a shocking. Like yeah. I was very- a little taken aback by what was happening, um, but I enjoyed it. That's cool. Did did um, what then transpired? Did you continue to go to that particular class and or studio, or did you have a uh, what What was your next steps? Yeah, well, you know, I um, I was going to classes at a bunch of different places. I, I also had a membership at a local gym, so I started going to the classes there. Um, I, I started, I was regularly working out like on the machine and I started adding in like asana practice in between like working out, you know, I would run over 
like the soft padded area and try to do my headstand. Um, I, I was throwing in yoga all the time in my life in inappropriate places, probably. <laughs> I just say yoga to be specific. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I was, uh, I got uh, really into one teacher in particular in DC. Um, as the time went by, I started practicing more and more with uh, a wonderful teacher named Faith Hunter. Um, and she had a studio that I really loved and a style, a vinyasa style that I really loved. Um, and all of these initial years in, in DC, my practice was, was a vinyasa yoga. And then even once I did uh, a teacher training, finally, I, I was also teaching and practicing vinyasa yoga. Um, and I had some, uh, like, I, I wasn't really into the Ashtanga at all. It wasn't something that interested me for a long time. Had you been exposed to it in terms of taking, uh, like, either a leg class or a Mysore that then gave, that you were able to make a decision that it wasn't something you're interested in? Or is it more something that you had kind of heard about and saw on the yeah. periphery that you just were, weren't attracted right away. Yeah, just right away, I wasn't attracted to it. I, yeah. I think I could say that um, initially those years in D.C., I was really into like a nice creative vinyasa flow, something yeah. that, that really took me on a journey. And, you know, that's something that vinyasa does. Vinyasa takes you uh, on the journey that the teacher decides. Right. Yeah. Um, and I was just really into that for a long time. And I still think that that is a, a powerful practice that's really useful for a lot of people. Mm. Um, so so that's what I was into for a long time. And then, you know, in a very odd twist of fate, um, I ended up in India. OK, so I, I actually went to India to uh, live on a commune in South India outside of uh, a wonderful town called Pondicherry. Um, there's a really fascinating international community there called Oraville. Ooh, yeah. Um, you've heard of it. I have. Okay. It does so sound amazing. I, yeah. And, and within Oraville, there's a reforestation commune called Sadna Forest. Um, and I had gone there to try to get my life together because my, my life back in D.C. had ended up being quite a mess. So I decided the best way to deal with that was to, like, hop on a jet, go to India, <laughs> yeah. and live in a con for a couple months. Joseph, is, um, that, is that with Sri Aurobindo? It is. You yeah. are exactly right. His books That's are sure. his his writing is just so deep and profound. I think he has just yeah. such an amazing mind but yeah. um sorry to interrupt you but that's okay. that's cool. I've always heard about that ashram. I'm so excited to hear about what your experience was like. Yeah, so both him and the mother who is like his his companion were fascinating characters and Arbindo has a really long interesting history of like development from being this sort of um, radical thinker in terms of Indian uh, freedom from British rule yeah, um, and a, a period of imprisonment and then onward to sort of changing his ways a little bit and founding this amazing community called Oroville and um, and, uh, yeah, he's really fascinating. And Oroville is a really incredible place. Um, did, I highly recommend that people go visit it. Did you meet him in person? No, he was already dead. I, he had already that's why I was confused. I thought, I thought you got it, got it. Because I, I got it. I understand. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, just, just I, I speak this way just in terms of, as you were mentioning, knowing him through his writing, yeah. knowing him through community that was created yeah. in his name nice yeah uh but i think i i i was headed somewhere with this story you so told me, i told me about the forest the forest pl the uh forest project or the, yeah so i had gone there to live in this community called sadna forest which is like a subsect of oroville um and you know this whole area in in around pondicherry was once the center of uh, colonialistic battle 
Mm. So there were battles here between the French and the British. And one thing that happened is that in order to have um, better conditions in which to battle each other, they clear cut huge portions of, of this region um, and really decimated it on an ecological level. Um, so Sadna Forest is um, a reforestation project that's sort of healing this damage done uh, by these these colonial powers battling each other. Wow. Um, yeah, so I went there and I lived for a couple months and um, there's there's a whole lot of other stuff that was going on with me personally concurrently to this. Um, and, you know, after a couple months, I realized that I, I had this feeling that I needed to do more with my time in India. So I started looking for yoga teacher training. Uh, because I loved yoga so much in D.C., I continued practicing it on my own there in Oroville. Um, and I just felt compelled to try to find a teacher training. Yeah. And I found one in all of all the places you can imagine. I ended up in Mysore, having never heard of it before. Nice. Yeah, I went from Pondicherry to Mysore, had no idea what Ashtanga yoga was, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, Lived there for a month with no idea who the Joyce family was, yes. besides them being on the like periphery of my awareness. And I did a sort of um, a traditional yoga training there with, with a guy who was uh, a former Ashtangi. Um, so that's that's how I sort of uh, started to weave myself deeper into to yogic studies and yogic learning. Was that was, with, was, was that with the man? Is it B in S I Ingar? No, no, no. I wasn't with I Ingar. This was with um, a former student of Kadabi Joyce's. Gotcha. Actually. Nice. Yeah, um, and he was still telling, teaching something that was very similar to Joyce Ashtanga Yoga. Uh, but he had set out a, a, a different um, set sequence, and uh, we did a lot more focus on breath work. There was a large breath work component to, to that month of training. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it was a little bit different. Yeah. But, but the yeah. same sort of bones that come out of all of the, the yogas that, that sort of came out of the, the Mysore Palace. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And Mr. Krishnamacharya. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I ended up there. I was in India for a total of three months or so, I think. And um, the last month of it, I spent doing a yoga teacher training in Mysore, uh, but not being an Ashtangi. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. And and then came back to the States and still didn't actually practice at the Shala in Mysore. And then what, what happened? Yeah. How, how did you make a transition over into the, the Ash- my, my source slash, uh, yeah, Ashtanga room. Yeah. Well, you know, just to give this a little context, um, I mentioned that my life in DC was sort of a mess. And then I've gone to, to India sort of looking for healing. Like a lot of people do, they end up on these, these sort of these quests to India to, to find something that's missing from their life. Yes. And for me, it was really, I was dealing with some very serious uh, drug and alcohol issues that were basically destroying my life. And um, I was on a a little bit of a pendulum between um, really useful, productive periods of getting better through 12 step work and yoga and then the pendulum swinging the other way to periods of um, extreme uh, hardship, homelessness, uh, complete breakdown of my life structure. Wow. Um, so this pendulum took me um, in and out of jobs. It took me in and out of my yoga practice. It took me in and out of um, places and locations. Um, so you asked, how did I end up with, uh, a Mysore practice. Yeah. Um, eventually, I, I I ended up in a period of really, really bad uh, abuse that led to a rock bottom and sobriety. 
Mm. Um, so this finally happened uh, without getting into all the details of it. Um, and in all of all the places it could have happened, oddly enough, it ended up happening in Miami. Mm. Where everyone else comes to party is where somehow I managed to. <laughs> yeah. Get yes. Um, yes. Yeah, I found a really good support group here. I found a good um, 12-step program. I found a good sponsor. Um, and I started to, to get some sober time together. Um, and while this sober time, these first days of sobriety were developing, I was um, really poor and paying for yoga was really hard. Um, and I just started looking around for the best deal I could find. Yeah. On yeah. on a yoga membership. And Miami Life Center happened to have a special that we still sometimes run, which was 30 days unlimited yoga for $30. Yes. And I was like, well, fuck, I can afford that. <laughs> yeah. So I got to learn Ashtanga yoga. Um, and that was it. Wow. I came to Ashtanga yoga because it's what I could afford at that time. That's so um, cool, Jess. That's amazing that you. Yeah. That, you know, you know, really, yeah. Yeah. The, the moment, though, um, any reservations or any doubts I had about the Mysore style immediately uh, went away. Once I actually got into the Mysore room and saw how it worked and and. Then again, almost immediately, I knew that it was for me. Yeah. Like I knew that this, this was for me. Um, once I actually tried it, I was immediately taken with it and committed to it. Um, and it was really, you know, I, I mentioned this pendulum back and forth in and out of of these times of um, sort of healing and then suffering. Um, it was the Ashtanga Yoga combined with the community of recovery here in Miami that really finally brought this stability in, into my life. And, you know, that's what yoga is meant to do. It's meant to be a stabilizing power. It's meant to uh, help us deal more wisely with the play of opposites that, that happens in our lives without fail. Um, so when I finally got into this Mysore room, which teaches us to, to embody the principles of yoga um, in a very simple way through asana, um, then, and when I started to do that every day, then finally some stability came to my life. Nice. Um, yeah, so, That's amazing. so I, I'm, very, I'm very grateful for Miami Life Center. I'm very grateful for that that 30 for 30 special. Um, and I, I'm grateful for, uh, the opportunity now to, to continue to have it in my life and for it to, uh, keep me sort of together. I, I think that it does keep me together even to this day. Oh, I hear you, Joseph. I have the same sentiments and can you keep me up to speed with, um, now you are the director of Miami Life Center. Is that correct? Yeah, that is that is correct. Um, what an amazing so, turnaround and or evolution of events to stumble in and start practicing to now you're running the Miami Life Center program. Yeah, it is. It's, it's really incredible. Um, and, you know, it's. I think it's a product of, of a number of things, you know, it's, it's a product of my, my relationship with Tim and Kino, who um, I had the good fortune of really developing a strong relationship with and who, um, you know, I, I actually practiced at Miami Life Center and trained with them in depth for a number of years. And then I moved away from Miami to sort of try to stand on my own two feet a little bit and to start my own uh, program in Guatemala. And even while I was there, I continued to re rely on them and their experience um, because they've already walked this path, you know? Yeah. Um, so the, the fact 
that we were able to deepen our relationship in that way that we were, I was able to study with them really has led us to this point now where um, they're both exploring like new, exciting things in, in their life. You know, for some time, Kino has been teaching internationally and um, running OM stars. And now Tim is really going to step up his, international teaching and step up his uh, work on some other exciting projects. Um, so that gave me the opportunity to um, learn how to share yoga on a different level from mm. this sort of um, uh, oversight level of nice. the program. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, what an amazing opportunity. Uh, the community down there is so inspirational. And I actually think that I got to meet you very briefly and or in passing at a Tim Miller workshop at Miami Life Center some years back. I, I don't know if you yeah. had taken one of his workshops, but I remember you were there and and um, so I got a chance to see you then. And so it's so exciting to see that you're you're able to you're holding down the fort. And is it true yeah. as well, just to keep me on the same page that the location that was in South Beach, that's changed. And now you're in Wynwood, which is uh, at the Miami Yoga Garage. Is that correct? That's right. So the, the South Beach location did close um, after, I think, 16 years. Yeah. Um, and. We moved to, I, we're actually in an area called Overtown. Um, and I like to really acknowledge that, that we're not quite Wynwood. Mm -hmm. We're in an area called Overtown. And um, it's got a rich history of its own. And it's um, the space that we've moved into is really incredible. It's, uh, it was once a neon sign factory. And then it was a... Uh, storage location for some rich guys expensive cars it's been all sorts of places <laughs> uh, and now we've um, reshaped it into a really beautiful yoga space um, and uh, I hope you come visit soon if you Absolutely. haven't already I have not been there since you guys have reopened or since it's been changed location so I have to come down I'm only like an hour and 15 north of you guys so um, I look forward to coming and practicing with you. Yeah, yeah, anytime. You're always welcome. And um, I feel like I should mention as well that one of our students, um, a dear student named Susan, is now, she moved up towards you, and I know she's now coming into your shala sometimes, that's right? right. She, that's right. That's correct, yeah. Susan's amazing. And I, I know she finished a training that you guys were offering I believe yeah. online and she's been coming here. So it's a little bit of a drive for her to get here too. But that's one thing that I've really appreciated over the years of having the consistency of the Miami life center in Miami is like holding down a nice, good solid fort for bringing incredible teachers into South Florida and giving us opportunities to make trips down there and practice with some really amazing teachers. So it's a, uh, it's been a great thing. And I, I'm curious, are you holding down teaching Mysore like six days a week? What type of work schedule and or teaching schedule? And how do you keep your work schedule up and your practice happening as well? How do you build balance into mm -hmm. both of those aspects? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I teach Mysore Monday through Friday, um, early morning uh, until uh, 6 to 8.30. Mm -hmm. and um, then generally I do my practice immediately after that. Um, for some time I tried to do my practice beforehand, but for me that really wasn't sustainable. Um, and I, I switched to practicing after. And, um, you know, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for to get it done some days. Yeah, and then on top yeah. of that, the, the, the rigors of, of running the shala um, it can all add up. And I was actually just recently on my mat talking to Tim. Um, and I mentioned that I was having some additional tightness in my hips and my low back that was making some of these um, 
I'm working through a, a tough portion of third series that involves uh, a lot of leg behind the head positions, yes. one after the other, yes. in, 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 in sequentially more ridiculous variations. <laughs> um, and, you know, he, he mentioned that when he first opened the South Beach location, um, he was working through the same area of his practice and that it was also hard. Um, and through our conversation, we, we came to the conclusion that sometimes it is good to like modulate your practice down a little bit to, to, uh, to account for the, the, yes. the rigors of life and the demands of your, your, your work and, um, all of that. Um, so what I find is I'm getting on my mat every day. Um, some days I'm pushing, uh, I'm getting through all of these asanas that are assigned through the third series, but some days I'm, I'm taking it a little bit easier to, to account for the fact that there are new and challenging things happening in my life that, um, are taking a little more energy and having a little more impact on my body and my, my mind, you know, I hear you. I hear that. Are you, what about you? Do you, do you change your, your practice a little bit to account for the demands of life? Or are you more um, so like do the same thing every day, uh, no matter what? Oh, I definitely modify and let how I'm feeling each day dictate and or um, guide how my practice goes. And I've noticed that with the evolution of what we went through and or going through from like 2020 and the shift from uh, being able to teach in the room over to teaching in front of a Zoom camera. And that required, I found, doing a lot more demonstrating. And, and um, I found, you know, like if I, I feel like if I'm leading a class in front of a camera, if I just stand there and talk while standing in front of a camera... It's, it's really interesting because I don't know what people on the other end are actually doing and if what I'm conveying verbally is making any sense. So I've always, I feel like I need to physically demonstrate it. So I say that because I feel like I'm practicing more mm. than I ever had before, but not, you know, it's, it's really different to the experience of practicing and teaching together. If it's like in a leg class scenario, um, is, is different than if I just get on my mat and I focus 100% on my practice. So I <clears throat> can definitely yeah. feel a variation between those two. And I guess I've had to, because of the challenge of doing so much demonstrating physically is so demanding that I've had to just accept that at this phase of running the studio and keeping everything happening and moving that i might need to rely on the demonstrating that I do during my teaching to be okay as part of my practice. So yeah, I've definitely, yeah. I've definitely had to modify it in that respect. Uh, I, I still am practicing every day, but on days where I know I have to demonstrate a lot, I'll just trying to cultivate being okay with th th this is it today. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. And you know, similarly for me, um, there's also this component of like really long days for me sometimes for, cause you know, I'm teaching the early Mysore and then uh, sometimes I teach a, a guided or MLC or own stars. And then there's things to do. Uh, we're launching new classes in the evenings. Sometimes there's event a day ago. I was here from, um, well, two days ago, I was here from, uh, six, 30 until 9 p.m. Yes. Right? Yeah. And then the day following that, the, the practice just shouldn't look like it would when I'm well rested. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I hear you. And that's fine. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Plus, I mean, uh, I'm practicing. Well, maybe I'll ask you a question. So then, because you're the director of the program, and if you're practicing in the same space where your students and or the fellow, the other practitioners that you're in the room with, um, do you find it challenging to maintain that sense of I need to kind of 
still really look good because I'm their teacher. Do you know that, that, mm. that dynamic of like, sometimes when I practice all by myself and I know no one's watching me, I feel like there's zero pressure and my practice mm. will be a certain way versus when I'm in the room with the other students for better or for worse. Uh, you, you kind of mentioned that today. Like you're like, okay, at the end of, I just finished practicing for better or for worse. And, and it's like that sometimes yeah. with, within the group, like for the better, I will want to really get involved in the practice a little more when I know there's other people in the room for worse. Sometimes I might push myself more because I feel like I have to uphold some sense of I'm the teacher. So I've got to be perfect or I'm the teacher and I've got to like yeah. really demonstrate this ability to rise above. How do you, yeah. how do you uh, navigate that? Well, you know, I've, um, something I've noticed here among, uh, students is that uh, very often there's a tendency for a strong and my source student to feel um, like if they don't do their whole practice exactly as prescribed down to the, the minutia of every vinyasa transition being correct, yeah. I've noticed that for some there's a feeling of not being good enough. Yeah. Um, and you know, because of that, I feel like I've taken a conscious decision to to share my practice in all of its variations with um, a lot of freedom. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I don't have any qualms about being an example of uh, shortening my practice when I need to. Yeah. Or, um, or modifying my practice when I, I need to. In fact, maybe I've really embraced that maybe a little too much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah. But, you know, if, if students, um, uh, I think there's some benefit to be had by, by, your, by my students seeing my practice being uh, modulated because yeah. I think practice should be modulated yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Nice. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we do, there's also so much benefit to uh, using it to, to burn away the laziness, you know, that sometimes in it, in us, or to sort of regulate our tendency towards disorder and chaos. Um, so I think it's a fine line also. Like, I know I need this practice because um, as I've mentioned, without it, my life has been a complete disaster. And I know that I need it to bring order into my life and to help me keep my mind well composed and to help me uh, know that I am able to to control what I can control, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the same time, we can't let that run amok so that we suffer for it too. It's not yeah, another thing point. to be suffered for. Good point. You know, it's, good point. It's got to have balance. Great point. You know, you have you through your yoga practice and your journey through recovery come into contact with the why you needed to travel down that path of um, maybe putting yourself in yeah. harm's way. Was there, because we have in yoga this idea of, you know, some scars and habit patterns. Then as we start to investigate a little further into our past, we may become yeah. acknowledge what might may or may not have happened when we were children. And yeah, has, has some sure. of that, has some of that come to light for you over the years in your journey? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, for me, um, luckily, I think, luckily for me, it's a very clear cut, uh, path of addiction and trauma that runs through a number of generations of my family. Mm. Um, and there's, there's no doubt about it. It's not a confused or muddled issue. It's just very obvious yeah. um, because my mother was an addict. She died from her addiction. Um, if you look a generation or two before her, you can see the, late, the things that led to, to how she worked in her life. Yeah. Um, and then my experience with her clearly impacted me in ways that led me to operate certain ways in my life. Yeah. Um, so these, 
these samskaras, I've, I've, I've used this metaphor before. Um, I, I think that, you know, traditionally samskaras are these little things that are just part of our subtle body and that they, they require us to carry out some sort of action or karma to, to bring balance or to clear them out. But I think that metaphorically, we can definitely think of samskaras on the level of the family and, and what we learn from um, our parents or our grandparents and, yeah. and people who were many generations before us. These sort of lingering um, balls of, of energy travel down through the generations and they, they land on us. Um, and then if we're not so lucky, then we never learn how to work with them skillfully. Like if we don't have any tools. If, if we don't find a way to heal, then they can destroy us. They can literally destroy us. Um, but if we are lucky, then we find some, some good ways to work with them, like yoga or 12-step philosophy. And we learn to unravel these little tangles and to sort of sort them out a little bit so that hopefully the quality of our own life improves a little bit and that we stop sort of like tossing them down the line. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think these, the, the, the samskara imagery really works well for the idea of generational trauma and how things pass along from from lives that, that happened before our current ones. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's fascinating, isn't it? It is, it is. I know it's, it's different, but I, I think the imagery and the, the metaphor holds true. Um, it's, it's fascinating. You're right. What other activities take up your time outside of yoga in, in, in Miami life? Do you, uh, what other things are you passionate about? Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm married. Um, I have a really wonderful husband and we have a dog and we have two cats. Nice. And I would say that I was just talking to someone recently and uh, we were discussing like what we do for fun and, you know, really like any moment that I'm not here that I get to spend quality with, with them is, is the best for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I really love animals. I really love my pets. I'm, I'm sort of obsessed with my dog. <laughs> so, uh, anytime that I get to be outdoors with her and my family is really the best for me. Um, yeah. And, and besides that, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a sci-fi nerd, so, um, I enjoy watching a good sci-fi show, nice. Star Trek, or reading some, some good sci-fi. Um, and it's even, it's the best when the, the sci-fi can sort of, um, intermix with yogic or, or spiritual principles, which you might be surprised happens, uh, a fair amount. I hear you. Well, is there one that you'd recommend to us? I love reading and I love sci-fi. So I'm curious what you've come across. I, uh, yeah, well, right away, like the, the sort of like textbook case of one that comes to mind is this movie and book cloud Atlas. Have you heard of it? Cloud Atlas. Why have I heard of it? Um, I, I feel I definitely have heard and or I've, I've heard of it, but I've not read it. Okay. So it's with, uh, the movie version is with Tom Hanks um, and Halle Berry. Um, and I really love this film and I really love this book. Um, and it's very much so, again, about how it, it's not um, explicitly about yoga or, or uh, reincarnation in the yogic sense, but it is about how um, we might embody different, I don't know, I'm, I'm having a hard time explaining it. Just go, go watch it. I will. <laughs> I will, man. I, I love reading sci-fi, so I'll definitely check it out. I love the, I appreciate the recommendation. Yeah. Uh, There's a quote, actually. Let me give you this quote. There's a quote that comes to mind from it, and this is just rough, uh, but sort of like the, the, the theme wrapped up in a nice little package is this line that repeats 
throughout the movie and the book. And it says, uh, from cradle to grave, um, basically from cradle to, to grave, we don't belong to ourselves, that we are tied up with everyone else. Mm. Um, and it's really about the power of, of connection and rebirth and healing. So um, that's, I think that's what you'll find nice. when you watch this movie or read this book. Very cool. I, yeah. I follow you, Joseph, on Instagram, just so everyone listening, um, your, your handle is Joseph Armstrong Yoga. And that's right. Uh, I saw a post that you wrote where you quoted, I'm not sure who you quoted, but actually it might've been maybe, well, you can help me, help me out with this one, but you said, uh, quote, he wore makeup, he wore black eyeliner and he grew his hair oh, yeah. out and he got increasingly weird, but don't call him trans. And I, yeah. and I, I really appreciate everything that you had to say about that. And I just wanted to ask you what, what you meant by that and, or what you were alluding to with that yeah. quote. Well, I really appreciate you mentioning that. Actually, I'm a little surprised that you, you picked that one out. Um, because that's a very serious, uh, important conversation for right now. And I'm actually grateful. Thank you for picking that out. To talk <laughs> yes. about. Um, because, I appreciate your honesty. You know, it was a really good post. Yeah. There's something happening in, in Florida right now and in like certain um, sections of political and cultural uh, psyche where um, uh, like this idea of transness, like there is um, a movement on one side for, for um, acceptance of um, queer people. And queer people is a big umbrella that includes gay people, lesbian people. Um, and then it goes through all these other expressions of gender identity and all the way to uh, transgender people. Um, and there's this, this movement on one side for more acceptance, more tolerance, more compassion. And then on the other side, there's this movement against that and this idea that um, somehow people living out what they perceive to be their truest nature is somehow destructive and wrong. Mm. And that particular quote that you mentioned, um, a, a prominent political commentator um, was implying that the shooter in Texas, that we could have known that this was going to happen, that uh. there's something wrong with him. Yeah. Because of some history of queerness or transness in his past. Um, now, first of all, the commentator was flat out wrong. Like the 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 comparison was unfounded and based on conjecture and an untruth. But even had this person been trans, the harm done by implying that they became a shooter because of their transness that we could, should have known that something was wrong because they were a, a quote unquote weirdo. Like that's really messed up. Yep. And um, yep. I think that it's something that needs to be identified. It needs to be called out. It needs to be spoken about uh, because, you know, you're more, I mean, it's just, it's unfathomable that people who, are literally the, the, the most um, sort of compartmentalized, the most sort of pushed to the periphery, um, the most suffering, that we would try to use them as a scapegoat in this way. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's unfathomable. And it's, it's harmful. And it really, it, it literally hurts um, gay, trans, queer youth in very deep and profound ways to have to hear this sort of stuff lobbed at them. And it's why these communities have higher suicide rates than, yeah. than others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, One of my so friends. Yeah. It, it, it's a big problem, especially here in Florida where they're passing laws to um, limit the right of 
of, um, you know, even talking about gender identity in in classrooms. And um, so it, this is in reference to the don't say gay bill, correct? Yeah, it's a, it's a bill they passed called don't say gay. And, you know, uh, they're, you know, the, the side that wants this bill passed and in place um, are convinced that it's going to protect children, um, that children shouldn't be influenced or coerced. And they've really latched on to this buzzword that I find, like, it makes my skin crawl, but they call us groomers. Mm. They say that we're grooming children. And that the, on, a, on the level of law, we need to fight this, these gay, queer, trans people from grooming the children to yeah. be like them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just, it, it's not true. Um, and what this law is going to do in the end, it's just going to further stigmatize people. And, you know, I knew from a very young age that I was different. Before I knew that I was gay, other people knew that I was gay. Mm. Before I knew I was gay, I was bullied because I, I talk different, I behave different, I like different things. And this was just my nature. Yeah. And there was like sexuality was not a part of it. It's just who I am. Yeah. Um and you know, this law is just gonna further institutionalize that sort of treatment of, of young people who are queer. Um, and it's even going to prohibit uh, things like children's books that, you know, there, there are a lot of children's books out there now because whether people like it or not, there are now a lot of gay parents. Therefore, there are children's books that illustrate uh, what gay families look like and that some kids have two moms, some have two dads. But this bill here in Florida would even prohibit schools from having those sorts of examples of children's stories about healthy queer families. Yeah. Um, so, so they're making a big mistake, and it's just going to further harm people who um, are already in danger of being uh, bullied, teased, and and oppressed. I agree with you. I think the problem and the challenge that I have with it even if we were to pick a completely different subject, like, you know, if we were just to change it from the LGBTQ plus group to um, any other subject where the answer to the challenge, the answer to the problem is don't talk about it. You know what I mean? Because yeah. to me, that's what that was what came obvious to me is that in part, the bill is kind of saying don't let people have these discussions in the classroom. And, and I, I agree maybe during a classroom setting that we should focus on our studies and not let it, the, the conversation go into anything outside of what the um, subject is about. But to, to tell people or to think along the lines that we shouldn't talk about something that, that really bothers me. That doesn't, that doesn't sit right yeah. either. I think discourse and, open and honest communication is the only way we are going to move forward. If we, if we're going to see yeah. eye to eye now, obviously some of these things are saying we don't want to see eye to eye. That's not our goal. <laughs> we don't even want yeah. to open up that opportunity. Um, which, which I find I have a really hard time with as well. I mean, that's something about yoga that I've always felt is at the crux of it is that anybody can practice yoga and it doesn't matter what your religion or your class or your creed or your, background and your uh, persuasion or whatever, I think it's open. So it seems that that would yeah. press us in the direction of wanting to respect other people and be open. So. Yeah. I, I, and you know, even just to add on to that a little bit about staying on subject within the classroom, please. Another thing to take into account is that it's already a problem in the classroom that queer contributions to society aren't seen in the mm. first place mm. and they are many. Um, so this is just going to further, uh, that's just going to make that, that problem worse too. Like yeah. there's, there's plenty of legitimate queer people who should be, um, mentioned in a lot of aspects of history and contributions to, to culture, technology, 
um, government, all of these things that they're, they're, they really are in some, some context, especially, um, you know, where I grew up in small town, North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, yeah. so, so it's just important not to, to make these issues worse and to not make them issues of law. Like we, we need to be moving the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate you being honest and thanks for making that post and, and thanks for letting me ask you to ask those questions. Cause I, I, I know some, yeah, I appreciate it. So, so currently can I ask you, I mean, in the realm of, uh, where are you at with diet and, what, you know, yeah. what, where are you in that department? I know like as yogis, we tend to, you know, waver and do different things. What, what are your thoughts and feelings yeah. around that subject? I know it's a big one and I know we're not trying to give dietary advice here, but like, um, yeah. what's working for you these days? But, you know, maybe, maybe we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. We are because, you know, I think, I think that being vegetarian is a, is a very important part of the yogic lifestyle. Um, my teacher in India will not hesitate to, if you ask him how you should eat, there's no doubt that it should be vegetarian. Mm. Um, and I have no qualms about saying that to anyone who asks me. So, um, I, I agree with my teacher Shiraji that, that the yogic diet is a vegetarian one. Um, and I personally am trying very hard for a number of years now to go vegan, um, you know, for me, becoming vegetarian was quite a process. The first time I called myself vegetarian, I was in high school. Um, and it was very hard for me because, as I just said, I grew up in the South and food culture revolves around meat. We even put meat in the vegetables to season them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it was very hard. And, you know, um, you know, I, I was in and out of of the vegetarian for a number of years. And then finally, um, again, another, another example of the practice stabilizing something in my mind and my life. When I started practicing Ashtanga yoga, when I realized that I really wanted to be a good example as a teacher, um, is when I was finally able to go full vegetarian. Mm. And this was around 2000 and, uh, what, 15, 16? So from the late 90s, when I was in high school, until 2016, I was on this ride of trying to become vegetarian. Um, and then finally, it took 100%. I haven't had a piece of meat of any kind since, since that day. Um, and now I've been on this process of trying to cut out all of the dairy and animal products. And again, there's some things that make it very hard for me. Um, some cravings that, that are lifelong, that are very hard to overcome, um, especially in terms of dairy products. Uh, but I, I would say I'm probably at this point about 90% vegan with some relapses into dairy use every once in a while. <laughs> I hear ya. Yeah. Nice. Do you cook? Yeah. Like, do you cook a lot? Are you in the kitchen, or does your husband cook, or are you guys both in? Yeah, we cook a lot. We we cook a lot. We both really enjoy cooking, um, and you know, we we often document our cooking adventures on Instagram, and people are always asking for the recipes of what we make. Um, I think that you know, I really love a good creative process. Um, and I, I, I like a process that feels like it has some artistry to it. And, you know, I do sometimes feel like my asana practice also has an element of artistry that I'm able to tap into. Um, but any process that has like this creative energy, this energy that is, um, creative slash meditative slash producing something, um, of value, I really get into so I love cooking. Um, right now, I've been on this kick of making vegan chicken salad, nice. uh, which is something in the South. Like we will 
we will put mayonnaise on anything, <laughs> mix it with some vegetables, and call it a salad. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I've been missing this chicken salad that I used to have. Um, so I've started making it uh, vegan with vegan mayo and with chickpeas or uh, some sort of vegan chicken. Um, it's really good. Nice. It's really good. That does yeah. sound good. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> right, right. And I I personally don't have any um, tattoo and or body art, but mm-hmm. I noticed that you do have some. Do you have any, yeah. do you have a tattoo that you have a story behind why you got and or any sort of um, re, like um, yeah. meaning behind what you chose? Yeah, of course I do. Um, again, it's sort of, uh, I, my favorite tattoo is this piece I have on the center of my chest. And um, it's interesting to me as a piece in a couple ways. Uh, so first of all, uh, it was done by hand poke technique in mm. Mexico City. Ooh. So instead of a machine, the woman, uh, an amazing tattoo artist, her name is uh, Karen Asim. If you're ever in Mexico City, go see her if you want a tattoo. <laughs> don't go see her if you don't want a tattoo. Uh, but, uh, oh, that's a really uh, painful spot, isn't it, Randy Sternum? I hear that's like a, a yeah. tough one. So to have it yeah, tapped, that would have... Yeah, I, I'm, I have a pretty high pain threshold. So um, I'm not, it, I wasn't really bothered by it. Um, I've, I've only had one piece of body modification ever that um, I wouldn't do again. Um, and that was my, my nose piercing. Uh, I think they either clipped the, the cartilage or went through a nerve or something. I don't know, but Ooh. I cried. It was oh, so bad. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the, the tattoos, they don't, they don't bother me so much. Um, yeah. And especially like when it's such a fascinating process as what, as I was witnessing with her work. Um, so she did um, a lotus flower with some geometric designs around it all by hand. Um, and to see her work, to see her process, to see her absorb. You know, this is something we talk about in yoga, this process of absorption. Mm. This woman was absorbed in her work. And she was really, in my mind, doing something yogic, whether she knew it or not. Um, her, her process was really beautiful. and wow, um, That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So in that sense, I love it. But also I love it because it has um, sort of like my personal philosophy, my pers- personal mantra is... Uh, woven into it as well and that says uh, exist gently Mm. um, which is sort of my my go-to motto because by my nature um, I'm not a very gentle person Um, I'm not very gentle with myself in terms of my my attitude towards myself my my nature towards myself is um, it's a little rough and tumble sometimes Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) It, but it's, it's gotten a lot better through my yoga practice and through years of like uh, sort of self-investigation and, and trying to counteract it. Um, but this, this motto of exist gently really is sort of my, my go-to thought for when I find myself caught up in, in the need to control or sort of uh, make everything as I think it should be rather than allowing things to be as they're going to be. Um, I, I try to, to tune into this idea of just being a little gentler with everything. Yes. Um, so, so that's pivotal in my life. I'm, I'm happy to see it every day. there, sort of, um, forever, uh, inked onto my skin. Awesome. I appreciate that yeah. story. I, I love hearing about that. Cause I, I've always watched whenever I saw uh, in Fiji and or in Polynesian tattoo work where they would tap it out. And I've always been really intrigued at that process. And I thought if I was going to get a tattoo, I would want to try to seek out one of those um, type of uh, art to, to, to have the yeah. art done that way. So that's kind of cool to hear how you noticed that she was yeah. so absorbed into the work that that's got to yeah. be pretty amazing to, to be the recipient of yeah. that. 
Yeah, I feel lucky. She, it was a special process. And, um, you know, I, I do have some tattoos that over the years I've become less satisfied with, <laughs> but I've yeah. never had any inkling of that with this one. Nice. I'm just nice. very happy with it. I don't think I'll ever have any doubts about it. Well, that's cool. And I'm curious, Joseph, you are, is it true you're getting ready to teach a retreat in, you said, in Italy? In Italy. Can you yeah, tell us so about that? In, yeah. In uh, September, starting September 18th, I'll be going to a really amazing retreat center called Yoga in Salento. And I'm co-hosting the retreat with a friend of mine. Her name is uh, Katie Schreer. Um, and I've had the good fortune of knowing Katie for some years and working with her in a number of different ways. She's based out of Germany. Um, so we decided to co-teach uh, a retreat in the, the southern part of Italy. Um, so you know how Italy looks like a boot? Yeah. Um, if you think of the heel of the boot, the location is there. So it's all the way down at the bottom. Oh, um, and it's near a really beautiful coast and really beautiful uh, Italian cities and countryside. Um, we're going to have daily Mysore. We're going to have some workshops on yoga and the nervous system, which is a, a prime fascination of mine. And Katie's going to teach on uh, some, some breath work modalities. Um, and it's going to be a lot of fun. It's a beautiful place with good food and, uh, a long history of creating a uh, community for Ashtangi. That sounds so great. I, I've had a chance to go to Italy and the food, and you hear the food is amazing and it doesn't taste yeah. as good as it does anywhere else but Italy. And that's so true. Uh, the food there is like just unbelievable. Well, um, what are the dates of that again, Joseph? You said September 18th? It starts September 18th. How long? And you... it's a one week retreat. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Now, now I'm wanting to go to Italy. <laughs> yeah, come on. It's going to be fun. <laughs> I've never been. I've, I've been to a number of places in Europe, um, but never Italy. So I'm super excited. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, I fly into Rome and get to check that out and eat some of that delicious food that you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. I feel that this will be another of those circumstances where my uh, dairy relapse comes into play. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we'll see. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Well, I, I know I don't want to persuade you in that direction, but the pizza is unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And what we'll is see, what we'll is, see what's on the menu for vegans? <laughs> right. in, in, let's see what happens. Right. And, and what is Katie's specialty? Is she also an Ashtanga practitioner? Does she have yeah. a background in other, other uh, something different? Yeah, she's um, authorized level two as of this past season. Uh, I'm not sure what level, actually. I take that back. But yeah. she is authorized as of this past season. Um, she's a really, really cool woman. She um, owns a studio in Bonn called the Vinyasa People that I've had the good fortune of visiting and teaching at. And within there, there's a really amazing uh, boutique called Yin Nation. And she is just one of the nicest, most um, warm and enjoyable people I've met. You should get in touch with her. She would be great to talk to you on your show. I was thinking that. I was going to ask you. I, I, I figured that maybe you'd, you'd be willing to open the introduction for me. That would be so great. Yeah. All right. Of course. Yeah. Cool, Joseph. I'd be happy to. Oh, man. Well, thank you so much. I... I really value the opportunity to uh, chat with you, Joseph, because I've been hearing so many great things about you and seeing you, your posts and social media. So I'm honored to have this opportunity to, to get to know you. And I look forward to traveling down to Miami and, and practicing with you as well. And I just really thank yeah. you taking time for us. And is there anything in closing that you could inspire us with not, not that you haven't already inspired us, but is there something that y you would like to uh, close with, with us for? Yeah, well, you know, um, I guess I would say that if you are trying to start a yoga practice or you're trying to start any kind of habit, um, that for me, um, 
the the most important thing that I learned in the process of starting a thing was just to keep trying, no matter what. Um, and you know, we say in recovery uh, to the newcomer when someone's just starting out, and it's so freaking hard. We and they have all these things going on, all these like um, sort of seemingly incurable or inconsolable thoughts and and events are happening we tell them to just keep coming back you know no matter what no matter how you're feeling no matter what happens just keep coming back to that meeting yeah. or just keep coming back to that yoga room or yeah. just keep coming back to whatever it is you're trying to do so uh just keep coming back <laughs> I love it. That's that's a great bit of advice. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. So oh, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Well, hopefully we can do it again, and I will definitely be down there to come practice with you. And once again, I really appreciate you and your time. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Joseph. Have a good, good one. Day. All right. Take All care. Right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks again, and I really hope that you enjoyed that conversation that I had with Joseph. And remember, you can check him out on his website, which is josepharmstrongyoga.com. Remember to look for him on Instagram as well if you like social media. And for those of you that would like to practice with us here, we have live stream yoga classes, and you can do a two weeks free unlimited live stream. Join in from anywhere in the world and for free. All right, so there's a link in the show notes below for that and wishing you well hope you're staying strong uh keep breathing keep practicing and also take the advice of joseph keep showing up don't quit keep going keep showing up and you got this all right take care you guys native yoga podcast is produced by myself the theme music is dreamed up by bryce allen if you like this show let me know if there's room for improvement i want to hear that too We are curious to know what you think and what you want more of, what I can improve. And if you have ideas for future guests or topics, please send us your thoughts to info at Native Yoga Center. You can find us at nativeyogacenter.com. And hey, if you did like this episode, share it with your friends, rate it and review and join us next time.